All right, so planetary surfaces involves looking at the overall surfaces of not only our planet, but all the rest of the planets in the solar system, and what we would expect if we found planets on other star systems. Things like impact craters, volcanism, weathering and erosion, if you have any kind of atmosphere. And then plate tectonics, if there's convection in, uh, in the planet's uh, interior layers, you're likely going to have plate tectonics of some sort. Uh, we take Venus and Mars, our neighbors, as examples of different things going on, different surface processes going on. But noting that uh, this planetary science topic can extend into other solar systems that we find and would expect to see down the road. So let's begin. We would expect to first see impact craters. And we do so, of course, on the Earth's surface, but elsewhere in the solar system as well. There is debris left over from the formation of our solar system. Uh, this is a dramatic picture of it here. It's pulled way out to show the different debris. Um, even though the green asteroid belt, which is what that is, seems very populated, like what you would see in Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, when they're flying through an asteroid belt. Um, it's not like that in, the, in our asteroid belt. It's very much... So the asteroids are so far apart that you couldn't see one from another. Um, but there are some asteroids that are hazardous that approach Earth and even cross the orbit of the Earth and the rest of the inner planets. Um, and so those are, of course, uh, the endangering impact with, with us or the other planets in the inner solar system. Uh, of course, most of the impacts that we had on Earth here have already occurred. We've, the Earth has already, through its gravity, brought all the largest things in within its orbit. Uh, but of course, there is still that, that threat and that risk out there. Meteoroids strike at extremely high speeds, which we're talking faster than a bullet. And of course, if you've got something the size of a city it, going as fast as a bullet, it can do some serious damage. The kinetic energy alone, uh, even with small objects, is very, very large because of that large velocity. And when you have an impact, it typically makes a round, bowl-shaped depression, which we call an impact crater. Uh, these are seen, of course, on our planet and all over the solar system. Here's a picture of the surface of Mercury, noting all the impact craters seen there, because there really isn't any kind of weathering erosion to speak of on the surface of Mercury. Earth's surface is weathered and eroded, so we don't see the impact craters very much. But in places like Mercury, the Moon, we see it uh, in great abundance. This is a great little animated GIF showing the uh, process of an impact and what happens in each of the steps. Uh, essentially, the rock is bent and ejected backwards, upward, and outward, and a central peak forms with terraced walls on either sides of the impact crater in a large impact. That's the final product there. But if you see the impact, there's a shock wave that ejects material out and down. The material often vaporizes as it ejects because it's so hot. And then again, the terraced walls and the central peak. Here's a picture of a large impact crater about 55 kilometers wide on the surface of the moon, noting that large impact peak and the terraced walls there, a great little example. And the Behringer Crater, uh, which is only 1.2 kilometers versus the 55 kilometers size one we just saw on the moon, the Behringer Crater still is, is an impressive uh, natural feature on the surface of the Earth created by a large impact. Um, but you can see because of the Arizona desert, little weathering and erosion has taken place, thus the crater is still visible. Most of the impacts, as I described before, occurred during the Earth's formation in a period called the late heavy bombardment. And this would have been kind of the last ditch effort for the Earth to kind of sweep up all the big, large objects in its orbit. There are huge impacts of hundreds of kilometers in diameter as the Earth was forming. Impact basin sizes would be those large, as large as the U.S., really, or the western half of the U.S. You can see 
couple of impact basins we see on the surface of Mars or in, uh, in, this, in the US there on the bottom right for comparison. Um, interestingly enough, we see the first fossil life on the Earth in the form of like ancient bacterial mats and so forth at about 3.5 billion years ago, which is after that late heavy bombardment, right? Nothing would have been able to survive during that period. Hard surfaces with little volcanism, tectonics and erosion have craters. Here's another picture of craters on the surface of Mercury and some on the moon, of course. Uh, we see many impact craters on the surface of Mars as well. There is, there is active dust storms and wind erosion on Mars, but not in a big enough scale to have repaved the surface uh, like we do see on the Earth. The Earth has active water movement, which is even more powerful than wind. Mars does show volcanic activity, not in, in a great enough amount to cause the surface to be repaved over these impact craters. Speaking of volcanoes, that's another major feature we see on multiple planets in our solar system and moon. Of course, we see volcanic eruptions heavily here on Earth's surface, where magma, of course, rises to the surface, it melts stuff along the way, it releases pressure as it decompresses as it comes toward the surface, creating gases that explode outward. Volcanoes often add gases to the atmosphere. And they help resurface planets. You can see basaltic lava flow here, even on the surface of Mercury, pictured in the lower left. Of course, of course all the maria on the Earth, on the Moon's surface, are large lava fields of basaltic lava, uh, similar to what we might see in the Columbian Columbia River flood basalts in Washington and Oregon. You see a picture here in the bottom right showing the Columbia Plateau. These are all basalt lava flows. Incidentally, there are also uh, stratovolcanoes that line the Cascade Range along the coast of Washington and Oregon. Uh, these are because of subducting tectonic plates. You don't see these stratovolcanoes everywhere in the solar system, uh, but they are unique to the Earth. Here's Mount Pinatubo, another example of a stratovolcano from tectonic subduction. Of course, of course, Earth has all varieties of, of volcanoes, including these stratovolcanoes. They also have shield volcanoes, which ultimately actually are the largest volcanoes on the Earth's surface. If you compare the volcanic shield of uh, Hawaii, which is the large island of Mauna Loa, with one of the largest uh, stratovolcanoes, Mount Rainier, you can see that Mauna Loa dwarfs Mount Rainier. Um, it's an enormous structure. In fact, if you compare Mauna Loa to uh, Mount Everest, Mauna Loa is bigger. If you put Mount Everest on the surface of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, floor of the ocean. Hmm. Incidentally, Mauna Loa is just a small volcano compared to the largest volcano in the solar system, which is called Olympus Mons on the surface of Mars. Also a shield volcano, kind of this gently sloping uh, volcano that looks very much like a a medieval shield from the side. So some volcanoes around the solar system, of course, Mount Rainier here, uh, Yellowstone, you probably know much about um, across the northwest Wyoming here, but active hotspot across the southern of Idaho uh, over the last 15 million years of eruptions. And here's Olympus Mons. You can see it from more of it. it is an enormous volcano in the equatorial regions of Mars. Uh, perhaps more impressive are some volcanoes and some of the moons in our solar system, like Jupiter's moon Io. Jupiter's moon Io is so close to Jupiter that it, it, it receives stretching uh, from tidal forces that bulge the surface of Io out 300 plus meters. And as a result, it creates lots of frictional heating and volcanic activity. So Io is constantly erupting volcanoes. Here's a beautiful picture of one from orbit. Saturn also has moons that are erupting. You can see uh, Saturn's moon Enceladus here erupting ice volcanoes, shooting ice crystals into space around the, the planet uh, from the interior that's usually pretty warm. Um, these areas are of interest, interest, of course, because where you have volcanic eruption, you have heat and you have water. 
So that would actually uh, be conditions necessary for life, even in a bacterial system, uh, on these different moons and places elsewhere in the solar system. Pretty interesting. Weathering and erosion takes place on the surface of a planet or moon if it has uh, an atmosphere. Of course, weathering is the breaking down of geologic structures, and erosion is the transporting of those materials by either ice, liquid, or wind. You can see, of course, a beautiful shape-shaped U-shaped valley here uh, on Earth made from glaciers carving through the area. Uh, but there are also uh, water-carved valleys and canyons on the surface of Mars. Here's a picture of one such canyon. There are wind-blown wind dunes on the surface of Mars. Uh, and we actually saw as uh, the Huygens probe parachuted through the atmosphere of Saturn's moon Titan, it took pictures of wind-blown dunes as well, as well as liquid methane-carved canyons. All types of erosion. Earth is unique in that it has plate tectonics. We don't actually see tectonic activity uh, much elsewhere in our solar system. Uh, this is because of the fact that Earth's interior is very warm and Earth's exterior is very cold. And so you get convection, and movement of rock. Um, so it's a unique sort of situation. Um, Earth's lithosphere then is made up of thick slabs of rock, all those tectonic plates. And they can be made of ocean crust or continental crust. Uh, and they separate and form new crust. They collide and dive underneath one another and crumple up with one another. They slide past one another. This whole idea of rock slabs moving on the surface of a planet is called plate tectonics. The Earth has divergent boundaries. Plates slide apart from one another. Where they slide past one another is called transform, and where they come together are convergent, either subducting underneath a land surface or even an ocean surface, or crumpling up in the mountain. Plate tectonics requires liquids. Specifically, liquid water helps because liquid water is cool. It's like it provides a cool surface for the contrast of the warm interior. So you get convection of rock. Rock, hot rock rising, cold rock sinking. That helps. Water also lubricates the crust as it dives into the mantle, which is something that needs is needed for plate tectonics to kind of continue to move. We don't see this on Venus because Venus's atmosphere is too hot. There's no liquid water on the surface of Venus, and therefore um, no temperature contrast and very little convective motion. Mars and Mercury are not hot enough inside to produce plate tectonics. Our best chance to see plate tectonics active is perhaps um, areas like uh, the moons of our solar system. So we'll look at those in just a second. Here's some uh, uh, evidence of active plate tectonics on Venus, perhaps prior to it really ramping up in temperature. There is some thrust faulting, it looks like, here on Mercury. So there are some tectonic features here, but not necessarily active plate tectonics. And the Tharsis bulge with Valles Marineris on Mars is thought to be a tectonic feature. Well, arrowed, arrowed and indicated there. Let's dive into Venus and Mars a little bit more here. We know a little bit more about the surfaces of other planets because of our neighbors, Venus and Mars. We've been able to visit them. Here's a picture from the Venera 13 lander of the surface of Venus. It's kind of neat. Uh, it made it uh, before it lost contact to the surface. And you can see a craggly, kind of uneroded, jagged, basaltic rock near uh, that land the landing platform there. Venus probably has an iron and nickel core. It's very similar to size of Earth. The uh, lander here would have had to contend with Venus's thick atmosphere, mostly carbon dioxide, super hot. It would have had to have made it through uh, sulfuric acid cloud droplets that block the surface of Venus, Venus's um, or, or view of the surface of Venus from orbit. 
And there really is, isn't any wind because it's just all hot. It's hot below, it's hot above. There's no kind of convection to speak of. And of course, Venus takes so long to rotate, it takes about uh, 200 plus days to rotate around one time. So there's not a lot of air movement anyway. Um, Venus is swamped through what we call a runaway greenhouse, which is uh, heat bakes the carbon dioxide out of the rocks. The increased carbon dioxide increases the temperature, which makes more heat bake out of the rocks, et cetera. A runaway greenhouse. Mars is also got a lot of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, but because Mars' atmosphere is so thin, it doesn't retain a lot of heat. Uh, Mars is about half the diameter of the Earth. And um, even though it's got a lot of carbon dioxide, it's pretty far from the sun. So rapid cooling um, of the surface of Mars would have frozen the water, capturing carbon dioxide. And the more cooler the temperature gets, the more water absorbs carbon dioxide. And so eventually all that carbon dioxide would get frozen and locked up in the, in the uh, ice of Mars, thus creating a very thin atmosphere. I do think liquid water did run once on the surface of Mars, though. There is rapid cooling between night and day because of that thin atmosphere. It doesn't really hold a lot of heat. So there's an over uh, 880 degree Fahrenheit temperature drop between night and day on Mars. As a result, there's strong winds that are created. Uh, the temp huge temperature differences cause air, air to rise very rapidly, sink very rapidly, creating surface you can see a global dust storm pictured on the bottom right there. Uh, Mars without a global dust storm on the bottom left, and then Mars with a global dust storm on the bottom right. You can see those are pretty frequent. There is indeed evidence of water drainage on Mars. You can see a pulled back, back view here on the bottom left, and then you zoom in to see the canyon and water flow perhaps through the surface of Mars. And they've also found conglomerate rocks on the surface of Mars, which are similar to what you find on the riverbeds of Earth, uh, indicating that sustained liquid water is, was part of Mars' past. But again, because of the cool off of Mars, it's likely that um, all of the carbon dioxide got locked in the rocks, or water froze, and you no longer have then that flowing water. We do see some evidence of water still present on Mars. There's um, places, there's a picture here of the Newton crater, the edge of the Newton crater, um, li uh, liquid water ice on, uh, frozen into the, the dust on the side of the crater. And you can see that during the, the warm time of the day, the ice begins to melt and it begins to run down the side of the crater, creating those streaks. And of course, this would be kind of highly briny water, like uh, water that has a lot of salt in it to make it flow. Um, but it doesn't last long because the atmospheric pressure is too low. The water just kind of like boils off into the atmosphere as water vapor. Interesting little side note there. We explained the lack of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the, the thinness of the atmosphere and the lack of water by this so-called runaway refrigerator effect on Mars. And this is where cooler temperatures, condensed water, the liquid water absorbed carbon dioxide because the cooler temperatures would like to have water absorb carbon dioxide. And eventually the water with less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere got cooler, which made less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, et cetera, until everything froze. And a lot of the carbon dioxide was captured. Because there is liquid water on the surface of Mars, we do uh, expect that we might might actually find bacterial life even. Um, you'd need some source of energy need to drive its metabolism. Uh, and any current life would have to be living below the surface because it would have to be protected from the ultraviolet radiation coming in from the sun to hitting the surface of Mars. Mars does not have a, a thick ozone layer like Earth does to protect its surface. so. Um, you know, life would have to be under underground, but nonetheless, scientists do recognize that connection between water and life. So let's look at surfaces. What we see in the surface of Venus and Mars, and some of the features that we see in general on the surfaces of planets. 